Hey there, people. So today I am bringing you my comprehensive Terraria Beginner's Guide, including the 1.4.4 Labor of Love, possibly, actually, finally, content update covering PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox, and mobile, um, including Android and iOS. So all the platforms have been updated all at once for the first time, and I've never really done a proper beginner's guide before, so I thought this seemed like a good time to sort of circle right back to the beginning. I am including some useful info for experienced players as well, particularly the tips that I'll include towards the end. I'm also including a link to the wiki and a link to my in-depth guides playlist in the description. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to cover a lot of ground here. I'm going to cover a lot of uh, little details um, that maybe people starting out and people even who have played the game might not know. So first of all, some of the most basic stuff of all, creating your player character and creating a world. Terraria has two separate difficulty settings for both the character and the world. Um, the normal character difficulty levels are classic, medium core, and hardcore. Classic characters will uh, also will keep all of their stuff when they die, except that they will lose some money. Um, medium core characters will also drop equipment in addition to money, but they can come back to get it. The equipment will be sitting there where they died. Uh, but they still will respawn. Hardcore characters are more like playing a roguelike in that if a hardcore character dies, it's permanent. Um, that's it. <laughs> Play Game over, man. Um, so, of course, there are tons of options. Um, journey mode is a whole separate thing. It's sort of like creative mode in that uh, you can create unlimited items once you've found enough of each one and unlock them through the research feature. Uh, you also have various special powers to set enemy difficulty, freeze weather and time and so on. Uh, so journey mode is not the normal way to play the game, but it's good for building or if you're struggling with the game. Uh, if you struggle to get enough loot and supplies, uh, your character must be a journey mode character in order to play in a journey mode world. Otherwise, um, the other character types and world types uh, doesn't matter. So, um, I'm just going to make a guy named Larry here. <laughs> this is uh, brand new, as if I'm starting um, from scratch. And you can actually randomize stuff, but uh, let's just go with the basics here. So... We'll use Larry, and when you um, create a new world, your world can be either Journey, again, which matches to a Journey character, or it can be Classic, Expert, or Master Mode. And so you can combine um, a player character that is Classic, Medium, Core, or Hardcore with any of these other world difficulties other than Journey. So um, my recommendation generally is just to go with, when you're first starting, go with a Classic character and a classic world, but uh, as you want to go on, you don't necessarily need to get rid of your ability to keep your items and respawn just to be able to play expert or master mode worlds. So classic is a basic difficulty level for the worlds as well, uh, based on the original design of the game. Expert and master mode are each harder in turn and will each reward you with some additional items in turn. So expert gives you some new uh, challenge and some new items and stuff master mode sort of is even harder than expert and gives you even more stuff there are also options for the world size and um bigger worlds will generally have more loot and more to explore but bigger worlds will also take longer to explore and travel around so i would recommend when you're first starting classic character classic medium world is a good way to go uh, with the pylons and stuff uh, which we'll get to, you can uh, get around a little faster than you used to be able to, so it's a little bit less of a deal to uh, have a larger world, but it's all right. Okay, and you may also heard the, hear the words uh, pre-hard mode and hard mode. These are not difficulty settings, but rather these are different points in the game. The first part when you first start the game is commonly referred to as pre-hard mode. Once you defeat the Wall of Flesh boss, the world changes. It becomes a hard mode world. So that's not something you choose at the beginning. That's something that happens when you defeat a boss in the game. That's what hard mode is after you defeat the Wall of Flesh. So it's sort of like a second quest or a second half of the game. Um, hard mode is actually bigger than pre-hard mode. There's more to it. Uh, so once you defeat that boss, you sort of, it's almost like starting over. It's almost like a, a whole new quest, whole new stuff, whole new enemies, whole new loot, all kinds of stuff. So not only is hard, more, hard mode more difficult, but it has more bosses, more enemies, and more loot. So another uh, basic thing to get used to as you are 
uh, starting out in the game is the controls. So this is sort of derived from the wiki controls page. The Terraria wiki is super useful and uh, for looking things up and finding out about things as you're getting started as well. But there are three main buttons that you need to use, three main buttons. Uh, so there's the use attack, which is left click on PC, right trigger on game pads or tap and hold on mobile. There's open or activate, which is right click on PC, the B or circle button on game pads or single tap on mobile. Of course, you'll also need to use the directions to move around. So on PC, that defaults to the WSAD keys on the keyboard. Um, on game pads, it's left stick. And on screen, uh, again, there's like a left um, touch screen thing. And then in terms of aiming, there's the mouse on PC or uh, the right stick or touch screen on uh, mobile or other touch screen like switch and so on as well. So um, then of course you have jump. Jump is the space bar on PC, left trigger on game pads and mobile has an on-screen button for that. There are various other buttons and shortcuts which can be very helpful and can also be reassigned. And that's why I brought up this whole chart. We're gonna refer back to this later as well. Okay, so this is indeed a brand new world. And when you're just starting out in a new world, uh, in Terraria, that can be pretty confusing as the game usually simply drops you into a forest with some basic tools and doesn't really tell you what you need to do. On some platforms, there's a basic tutorial, but uh, some platforms there's not, like here on PC. So you can use your pickaxe to um, mine blocks, dig or mine, and your ax to cut down trees for wood. Uh, wood is a good building and crafting material right at the beginning of the game. Once you have one or more houses and some basic equipment, you can go looking for better materials. Um, you also have a short sword, which you can now aim uh, since 1.4. So you can aim that uh, up and down, not just stab sideways like it used to be. So that's a little more useful than it used to be. Once you've managed to kill some slimes, you will find some slimes hopping around. Um, then you can craft torches from wood plus some of the gel that those slimes dropped. The most important thing at the very beginning of the game is to build a house. Um, since once it gets dark, you will face harder enemies and you will need a place to stay safe and to store your things as well. It is master mode. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, you'll have basic crafting. See, I got some gel, so now I can make torches, as I say. That other guy who's just wandering around there, that's the guide. You can give him uh, materials and he'll tell you what uh, you can make. We'll talk about that a little afterwards as well. Uh, but yeah, you're gonna wanna build a house. If you meet certain requirements when building your house, you can use it both as a spawn point and as a house for one of your NPC characters like this guy to live in. As you meet other requirements in the game, you can have additional NPC characters move in if you build additional houses for them. NPCs can give you information, supplies, healing, and bonus effects. Uh, once you have a house, you can start exploring and or you can focus on crafting some better gear. To some extent, it can be easier to get basic early gear by faster by exploring and looting chests, but that also depends on your abilities and your comfort level going out and uh, fighting enemies and so on. Okay, so in terms of building a house, uh, building a valid house, you can build a basic shelter wherever you like, into the side of a hill, underground, and so on. But personally, I like to build my houses floating up and above the ground, about as high as I can jump, because this makes it a lot more difficult and, in fact, um, arguably impossible if you build it right for enemies uh, to get inside. So if you only leave a single platform outside of the door, then that will, um, I'm gonna build a door here, but then that will prevent enemies from being able to break in to your house. So this is my strategy. I like to um, build my house just up floating and I can stick that door there. And because there's only one platform there, um, they basically will not be able to break down that door is just kind of the mechanics of how it works. Um, but for an NPC to move into the house, it must meet several requirements. First, it must be at least 60 and no more than 750 blocks in total size, including the walls and the frame. So including the outer outline of the house. It must also have a full background wall, which generally must be placed by the player. So uh, you can build a workshop, or sorry, a workbench. Once you have enough wood, um, that's one of your crafting options right here. And then once you have that, you can build these walls and just fill that in as the background wall. That needs to be there 
for this to count as a valid house for an NPC to move in. So once that's done, um, it must also, uh, because yeah, generally naturally occurring background walls will not count um, as a valid background wall for a valid NPC house. There are a few exceptions. Um, most early game background walls can be crafted just simply at a workbench like this. Uh, there are other types that can be crafted other ways later in the game as well. It must also have a flat surface furniture such as a table or a workbench conveniently in this case. Uh, needs comfort furniture such as a chair. And <laughs> it also needs a light source, such as a torch. Um, so again, I haven't even crafted those yet. I like to put a couple just to make it look nice. <laughs> and uh, there you go. That should now count as a valid house. Um, you can check whether it's valid by going to the housing tab. So you have your equipment tabs, you have two of those. And then uh, you have a housing tab. If you use this question mark, you get this message. This house is suitable. So that's literally just makes the basic requirements for a valid NPC house. And uh, actually, if I want to, I can even use this housing tab to assign the guide to this house. Um, of course, he can't actually make it in here um, by walking, but don't worry, that's okay. Uh, you can, as I say, assign the NPCs to houses that way. It may take a while for them to move. Um, they will often do it when you're away from the house. If they can't walk in directly, when you're away exploring out in the world, they'll just teleport magically in when you're not around to see it. They will not teleport when you're there to see it, but uh, if you go away, eventually you'll just find they're in that house. Um, arranging your storage chests and crafting stations can make things a lot quicker and more efficient as well. Generally, you won't be able to use crafting stations as far away as you can access chests. Of course, I don't even have any chests yet, uh, but we'll get there. So you can place crafting stations at walking level, and then you can push, put chests above and below that for easier access is generally the way I do it personally. Again, you know, there are choices and strategies to that. There are many block types and special crafting stations for making more interesting buildings. If you want to remove background walls or create slopes or stairs, stop. It's hammer time. So uh, you can craft a basic wooden hammer from uh, eight wood at a workbench, or if you want a better one with some metal that you get later, you can use eight metal bars and three wood at an anvil. And so just to show, Yes, I can take out those wooden walls. I can uh, make these corners, nice angles. And that's part of the many ways that you can make things look nicer in this game. I'm not a big aesthetics guy, but yeah, there's a lot you can do in terms of building in this game. I should mention actually that you should actually have a campfire near your base. There are a lot of items that can give you uh, bonuses and stuff and that will help with your healing. But let's first talk about uh, crafting. So uh, in, in order to craft better items and equipment, you'll need some crafting stations. The first crafting station, as I mentioned, is a workbench, which you can craft from 10 wood. Once you have 20 stone, four wood and three torches, you can craft a furnace in order to smelt ores into bars. So that's gonna be uh, very important as well. Now, I don't yet have the materials to keep going from there, but uh, once you have five iron or lead bars, you can craft an anvil at the workbench in order to craft uh, metal gear from uh, metal bars. Uh, note that you can always take materials such as wood to the guide and see what items you can craft from them, including what other materials that you will need. It's a good idea to save anything in the game that is labeled as a material, even your copper short sword. Uh, you'll be surprised to find out what you might need later on in the game. So you have dedicated slots for armor and accessories. Don't confuse them with vanity and die slots. So first of all, let me just show you here. You can craft, you know, basic uh, wooden armor to start with. And a little tip, uh, if you're on PC, at least it's right click just to equip these directly into the appropriate armor slots. So this rightmost uh, slot, these are your armor slots and then your accessory slots. Of course, it's labeled as well. And then next to that, you have social items. So you have vanity to uh, dress up in costumes and make yourself look different. And then you have social accessories to uh, change your appearance. And there are even dyes. I'm not gonna get that far into it. There's a lot to this game. <laughs> um, but make note of your uh, 
with the update, actually, you have three loadouts here as well. So you can actually have three different sets of stuff, um, which will become super useful later when you have specialized gear for certain purposes, like fishing, which I'm going to talk about a little later as well. Let me just show you uh, what I mean in terms of talking to the guide. You can literally just like give him the wood and he will show you what you can make from wood. Everything that you can make from wood, whether you have the other materials or not. Um, according to, to currently discovered stuff, let's say. And you can do that with um, various materials as well. Like if I give him, I found some tin, I have a nice little deposit of tin, I can make tin bars from that. Of course, if I make tin bars, then that's gonna show me everything I can make from those and so on. And also you should be um, aware of obviously your health and your mana. Um, it defaults to fancier looking versions of these. I had this on classic because it used to be the only ones that would give you the number, but uh, your life is up in the corner, your hearts um, and the number can be shown with that as well. Your mana is over here. That's gonna be important for magic weapons and mage players. Uh, and those can both be expanded, of course. You can increase your health by finding, mining and using life crystals underground, basically exploring underground, look for um, heart shaped red things um, and mine those and then you can use them uh, to increase your life but be aware that increasing your life will me will begin to spawn new challenges it is of course still worth it um, when you get to various stages of life different uh, things will start to happen in your world eventually that will include boss encounters and so on and events um, you can also increase your mana by crafting and using mana crystals, which are made from fallen stars at night. That's these things, the stars will fall, you'll hear that noise um, and you'll need to collect. I, I don't quite have enough, you need three of them for your first mana star and that's how you expand your mana, which you can then use with magic weapons and so on. Uh, defense comes from armor and can be further boosted by certain accessories and modifiers. So now that I've added these, um, armor piece or pieces uh <laughs> you have a defense indicator here so i now have three defense that's from this piece is worth one this piece is worth one and the full set including the pants in this case is an extra one as well so that's a whole massive three defense but of course you can get better stuff than that um, also accessories and the modifiers for accessories can boost your defense further as well. Um, weapons and accessories do have modifiers which modify their stats slightly. Armor does not have modifiers, um, at least not in the regular game. Once you find the Goblin Tinkerer NPC, which is after you defeat the Goblin Army Invasion, and then you still have to find him deep underground, he can change the modifiers by reforging them for money. So right now I have a dull copper short sword. But if I had the Goblin Tinkerer, I could go to him and I could give him my uh, copper short sword and ask him to reforge that and turn it into something awesome like a legendary copper short sword. <laughs> so whenever you're ready, uh, you can set out across the world and start exploring. And the easiest way to get underground is just to find a cave entrance like this. Terraria worlds contain many different biomes such as forest, desert, snow, jungle, ocean, and evil biomes. Some of these can be a bit difficult to survive in at the beginning of the game. The evil biomes are of course particularly difficult at this point. So just things to be aware of there. Um, each world will have either a corruption purple biome or a crimson, which is a red biome. Those are the evil biomes. If you find it difficult to get across these biomes, the game is Terraria, you can dig down. And as you can see, um, easiest way is to just find a cave entrance like this on the surface of the world. And that will leave you, lead you down underground. Um, caves are also more likely to contain things like chests with some basic loot. Oh, that is perfect timing. <laughs> I honestly didn't know this was here. Um, but that's exactly what I was looking for. Now, when you empty your first few chests, it's a good idea to keep the chests themselves because basically that gives you a place to store your stuff. So there is a loot all button and then um, you will need to mine the chest. I guess it's nighttime now, so these guys are after me. Uh, but basically you will need to mine that chest in order to be able to take it back to your base. And of course I didn't craft better gear yet. So I'm going to have a hard time fighting these guys, which means I'm going to have 
a hard time getting that recall potion that I could get from that blue slime, which would have taken me back to my base, but I guess dying works too. Um, so as I say, take the chest with you, loot all um, at the beginning. You might as well take everything. It works faster. You can take the chest back to your base uh, by mining it with the pickaxe. And then you can just place that conveniently right in your base. And of course you can eventually um, craft additional chests as well, but for now you can just stash things in here you know what, that's better than my, <laughs> my short sword. Um, you can stash stuff in your chest. Um, and yeah, it's very useful. So ultimately the underground is full of caves. You will want to get better loot uh, and you will get better loot as you go further down. You can also find pre-existing minecart tracks underground. Uh, if you find a minecart track, you just use your open activate button to ride on the minecart. It'll just like poof spawn a minecart for you by default you can get uh, better minecarts too but um, you can expand and link minecart tracks up or you can build new ones if you like as well uh, hammers again are also going to be useful here um, you can use that hammer to configure minecart track junctions where different tracks meet and also to configure the endpoints you can turn those endpoints into bumpers and things like that uh, different biomes will have unique loot, particularly the desert biome, the snow and jungle biomes uh, early in the game. Those are going to have special loot for you. Eventually, you can also find the dungeon and at each end of the world, you will find an ocean. If you dig down far enough, eventually you'll dig all the way down to the underworld and wind up there and uh, find out all the fun and all of the loot and stuff that you can get there. Platforms and ropes are great for getting around at the beginning of the game. Uh, just place rope until it stops. Did I get some? Yeah. So uh, just to demonstrate that, if you're placing rope when it stops, that's as far as it can go. <laughs> a nice and convenient way of knowing um, how far the rope can go down. And then of course you can jump on the rope and, uh, and move down, careful that you don't fall off the end. Once you have enough gems or find a hook, you can craft a grappling hook for quicker mobility. You can use recall potions like the one that slime was carrying that I didn't get from him to return for, to your spawn point. And eventually you can find or craft a mirror. You can find them in chests underground. A uh, mirror serves essentially as an unlimited use recall potion. And you can now craft them since the update with 10 glass, three diamonds and eight gold or platinum bars, which is great that you don't have to rely on luck to get them anymore. There are also magic and demon conch or conch items. Yes, both pronunciations are valid depending where you live, <laughs> which teleport you to the ocean and underworld biomes, respectively. Magic conch will teleport you to the ocean. The demon conch will tell you, teleport you directly to the underworld. And there's, again, those are materials. You'll want to keep them for later, but uh, moving right along. Okay, so another important uh, point, which is really useful uh, throughout the game, but uh, as soon as you can do it, is to set your spawn point. So by default, you will spawn approximately in the center of the world on the ground, which means when you die or anything like that, you're going to be sitting out here in the open, unless you build your house there, and then you're going to have other problems with people breaking into your house potentially. So if you would like to move your spawn point, what you want to do is craft a sawmill and then use that to craft a bed. So first of all, you'll need to craft some chain or iron, um, so some chain from iron or lead bars at the anvil. So first of all, I need my anvil. I did gather enough bars to finally make that. And then you can craft some chain there. You get 15 chain from one bar. You actually only need, I think it's one for this purpose. Uh, I am gonna need some more of these lead bars though. So let's toss that in there too. Um, so then once you have some chain, you can craft the sawmill from 10 wood two iron or lead bars and one chain at the workbench. And that's worth uh, mentioning as well that the way Terraria works, you get one of two ores most of the time for each tier of ores. So you have either copper or tin that you'll find underground. You have either iron or lead, and those are more or less equivalent. You'll get different stats from equipment that you make from them, but more or less equivalent. So, uh, and so on, it's gold or platinum. Uh, silver or tungsten and so on so again sawmill 10 wood two iron or lead bars and when it says any iron bars that's what that means and one chain and so we can do that and once you have that uh, you can craft a loom from 12 wood so uh, you have to stand near the crafting station to craft these things so then I can craft a loom and I can do that 
And then once I have a loom, I can make silk, which is a, an essential ingredient for a bed, of course. So uh, once you have a loom, you can craft uh, five silk from 35 cobwebs, assuming they haven't changed that recipe. Yeah, it's seven each, so we need five. And then once you have that, uh, you can finally craft the bed at uh, the sawmill itself from the five silk and 15 wood. Do, 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 do. Here we go. And the bed is the thing that you need to set your spawn point. Now, um, that all being said, it is possible to find a loom underground in a cabin. If, if you're lucky to find a loom early in the game, you can actually skip the sawmill and um, just craft your silk at the loom that you found. And then if you have some pumpkin or uh, cactus, you can actually make a pumpkin or cactus bed from the five silk and 15 of either of those things at the workbench. That's also a thing as well. Um, I'm just going to move this loom out of the way because I haven't built my house big enough just yet to place that bed. There we go. And uh, after placing the bed, you also need to set it as your spawn point. So you will use open or activate at the foot of your bed. And there you go. You get that message spawn point set. Um, it's worth noting as well. Once you have a bed, you can actually uh, go on the other end of the bed and use the same button. And this actually accelerates time and that allows you to do things like skip the remainder of the night. So it's super useful. Um, the bed must be inside of a valid enclosed space for all of this to work. Uh, but, well, I'm not sure about the sleeping part, definitely the spawn point part. It doesn't have as many requirements as an NPC house, but it does need walls and a space enough to stand uh, in an enclosed space. So again, once you uh, lay on that bed, I've just skipped ahead to morning here as well, and those zombies will wander off, and that lets me get out and about again as well. Um, so that helps you pass time much more quickly, except during some events. It also helps you to regenerate your health faster. So bed is super useful uh, in addition to the spawn point at this point as well. So a few more little things, as I mentioned earlier, first of all, uh, when you get enough fallen stars, actually it's five, it used to be three, uh, you can craft these mana crystals and expand your mana, which is great when you find something like this wand of sparking uh, Which is a magic weapon that allows you more ammo for that um, Also, if you see something like this little red flower, make sure to mine that out That is a summoning item and that allows you to summon a minion uh, Abigail's ghost. There are of course other minions in the game. Another thing is um, You can actually single hit the trees if you just give them a single hit, if you don't want to actually chop them down, uh, stuff comes out. And sometimes some of that stuff is food as well. Food is really important, um, especially as you get into expert and master mode. It gives you a series of buffs. And uh, so another thing that you can do when you have enough um, iron bars, then you can also craft a cooking pot. And so I've made myself one of those here, and I've used that uh, when it rains, you can get a bug net from the, uh, not just when it rains, you can get the bug net from the merchant anytime, but when it rains, um, you'll find worms and goldfish, walking goldfish, and you can use the goldfish and a mushroom and a bowl, which you can craft from clay at the furnace to make bowls of soup. That's a nice, uh, easy one fairly early on. So uh, sometimes you'll get food from the trees with the single hits as well. So just keep all that in mind. Um, and of course, there's more ways to get food as you go through the game. Another important thing since Terraria 1.4 came along is pylons. If your NPCs are happy enough, they will sell you a pylon for their current biome. The pylons allow you to quick travel or warp between the different biomes. They will only work if at least two NPCs are presently living in houses near the pylon. In the current versions, NPCs will be unhappy if there are more than three housed near each other. So since 1.4.3 specifically, if an NPC is in a biome that they like, and each NPC does have their preferences, and there also aren't more than two other NPCs nearby, then that can make them just happy enough to sell you the pylon for that biome. So the die trader happens to like the desert, so he, uh, and there's only one other, there can be up to two others nearby, so he is willing to sell me that pylon. Um, except that I don't have enough money, but <laughs> um, I'll show you that. Anyway, um, otherwise an easy combo in terms of happiness is to put like the arms dealer and the nurse near each other because the arms dealer 
loves the nurse and vice versa but specifically the arms dealer actually sells things so he will sell you the pylon in most biomes except for snow because he hates the snow biome another combo is to put the golfer with the angler the golfer loves being near the angler uh, talking to the npcs will give you hints about their happiness you can check their biome preferences in the bestiary as well or go to the wiki for complete details that took way longer than it should have to get the money uh, obviously these are not cheap um, 8 gold and 90 silver and that's probably with a discount anyway uh, there we go got the pylon and that allows me now to warp back over here so let's talk about something else uh, let's talk about classes so terraria actually contains a flexible class system where weapons have class-based damage types and certain items accessories armor and other equipment will boost your capabilities for each class you can mix and match classes as well as change between them freely for the earlier part of the game this doesn't really matter that much uh, but as you begin to get farther into the game it will gradually become more worthwhile to specialize in order to maximize your damage and abilities for one class with the new loadout system you can also potentially have sets of gear for different classes as well so the four classes are melee, ranged, ma mage, and summoner. Uh, mage is magic, of course. Each have their own progression of armor and accessories to obtain throughout the game. And these are just some armor examples in the first part of the game for each of these classes that you can get. So um, just to make that point that much clearer, you can see here... Um, Broadsword, of course, is a melee weapon, so it says melee damage. The Wand of Sparking is a magic weapon, so magic damage. And uh, yeah, this is uh, Abigail's Flower. The little ghost here is a summon a minion, so summon damage as well. So that's the general idea. And uh, of course, the other one is ranged. Yeah, technically, uh, shurikens range damage as well. So there you go. That's uh, different weapon types, uh, different damage types, and you can end up matching up armor and accessories with that to maximize the damage for one of those areas. That'll become very uh, important as you get particularly later in the game. Now, another topic in the game is gardening and potion making. So herbs and other ingredients are important for making potions, which will give you buffs or boosts to your character, just like food gives you one of these. Um, and there are actually three different levels of food, by the way but um, food gives you a buff you can get additional buffs by potions and you can craft those potions yourself as well as find them so um, you'll get herb seeds when you cut down certain plants you'll also get grass seeds sometimes and eventually you can buy them from the dryad character which you get after defeating um, at least one of the bosses uh, grass seeds there are different types that can be planted in dirt or mud depending on the type of seed you can also plant herb seeds um, in the type of grass or other terrain that they would normally grow in. So the first thing you'll probably find is day bloom. I've got a bunch here. Uh, I've been cutting down day bloom as I run around. I also found some shiver thorn and some water leaf. And uh, there are certain times that each of them will bloom and you'll get the seeds at those times. You can also get herb bags. So I've got uh, four of those actually. So I may as well open some of those and see what else I can get. Oh, I got tons of stuff. Look at me. <laughs> so we got uh, Deathweed and Moonglow. And you can find these plants as well in different areas. Fire Blossom. So I did very well here, actually, <laughs> from those herb bags. Anyway, um, so you can plant the different types of herbs in the type of terrain that they would normally grow in, in the grass or whatever else. Uh, better yet, though, craft clay pots from clay at your furnace. Or uh, once you have the dryad, you can also buy... Um, planter boxes which work similarly uh, the difference is that planter boxes basically work more like platforms you can walk through them whereas of course uh, clay pots you actually they, they act like a block so I'm just gonna make a couple of those for now and you can put these wherever I'll just throw them here for the moment and then you can plant um, whatever herb in those clay pots and it's a similar idea uh, for anything else as well um, with the planter boxes you can basically just place those as you would platforms and then you can grow stuff in them as well and basically there are um, all these different herbs and those are the how they look essentially uh, so there's day bloom moon glow blink root water leaf, shiverthorn, deathweed, and fire blossom. And when you first plant them, as you can see when I planted mine, you get a little sprout, then they will mature. 
but there are only certain conditions under which each one will actually bloom. So it's best to harvest herbs when they are blooming. The timing of that depends on the herb. Uh, day blooms bloom during the day, fire blossom at dusk, moon glow at night. Uh, water leaf blooms when it's raining. Deathweed blooms during a full moon or a blood moon, which is after all another full moon type. Uh, Shiverthorn matures after a while and then remains blooming, which is a little different. And then blink root blooms sort of at random. So uh, plants planted in grass can be cut down with weapons and can be hit with falling stars and so on. But pots or planter boxes must be harvested with a pickaxe, which is why there's such an advantage of using uh, the pots, clay pots or planter boxes. Um, so that gives you the advantage that you're not, they're not being accidentally destroyed, not destroyed by enemies, um, and they're not accidentally harvested. So uh, that's why you want the clay pots or the planter boxes ideally, although you can plant them in grass and so on. Now, once you have all that, you can actually create a, po a potion crafting station, which is as simple as a flat surface furniture object with an empty bottle on top. And that counts nice and simple as a potion crafting station. And once I've done that, then yeah, no, the only problem is that I don't have any bottled water, but uh, with empty bottles, you can craft healing potions with a mushroom and a couple gel. Let me go grab some water. So you can simply take um, empty bottles to any body of water. And if you're close enough, you can craft bottled water, but I thought a nice neat little trick I'll show you here. If you have, um, you can configure blocks just like this and I put a platform there so it still counts as a flat surface to walk across and I can place furniture on and so on without messing up the house. Uh, that's a nice little trick. You can also craft a sink as well, uh, but you can see now I can craft bottled water right here. <laughs> and uh, the way I've designed my house that fits very nicely in here as well. So I can craft a bunch of those and then I have all these herbs and I go to my potion crafting station. And uh, well, I would have thought that I would be able to craft more things. Maybe yeah. if I open this up, yeah, that gives me a few more things based on the things I have in there as well. I guess I have, I have mostly seeds and not so many herbs. So um, here we go. Can craft things like regeneration potions, night owl potions, battle potions, archery potions, danger sense and uh, flipper potions just based on the stuff that I have on hand here. There are tons more potions. I actually made a potion guide a long time ago if you really wanna know. Uh, but as I say, empty bottle on a flat surface. You just need some herbs and various other ingredients. Later on, you can get an alchemy table from the dungeon eventually, which uh, basically is just an improvement in terms of it uses fewer ingredients. It'll save you some ingredients. Um, and yeah, potions and flasks as well is another thing you'll be able to craft later will require either empty glass bottles or more commonly, most of them require bottled water like I showed you there. Uh, you can also craft sand into glass at the furnace and then glass into bottles. And then as long as you have some water nearby or a sink, then you can fill them near water and go nuts, craft some potions. Uh, they'll give you a real edge at certain times in the game especially boss fights. There are certain potions that are super useful and there are tons of other potions you can discover as well. So a whole other topic in Terraria is fishing. Fishing is a remarkably useful activity and can be a nice change of pace as well. You can get gear, materials, and more by fishing for them and you can improve your fishing equipment to get even better stuff. To start out with, you just need a fishing pole and some bait. So the most basic fishing pole is crafted from eight wood, but you'll have better luck um, if you craft one from metal. So you can see here, eight wood, I can craft a basic wood fishing pole, but that only gives me five fishing power. So if you can get eight lead or iron bars, you can craft a reinforced fishing pole, which gives you an extra 10%, 15% fishing power. So I'm gonna go with that. And then of course, you'll also need some bait. Um, and when you get demonite or crimtain bars, you can craft an even better, uh, step up fishing pole from that and so on. There are of course plenty of fishing pole upgrades in the game. For bait, uh, you can buy a bug net from the merchant and you can use that to catch critters, various time, kinds of critters, uh, such as actually here's a firefly right here. So um, that's a critter, you can catch it. <laughs> and uh, you can see here, 
that has 20% bait power. Worms have 25%. Uh, one of the best baits that you can use early in the game is actually enchanted night crawlers. So I'm just going to go over here because I have a nice pool of water right here. Enchanted night crawlers can be crafted from worms and falling stars. And you don't even need to be at a crafting table for that to happen. So those are 35% bait power so that's a really great option early in the game and then your fishing hole needs to have at least a hundred blocks of unobstructed water to avoid penalties so if you have like blocks inside the water or blocks like right at the surface of the water that can count as obstruction and it counts from the surface downward um, and of course however many across as well uh, but each segment is counted downward from the surface so anything that interrupts that it stops counting <laughs> and you need a hundred blocks to avoid penalties so make sure there aren't any blocks between the bottom and the surface or blocking the surface and then basically you just have your bait and your fishing pole and now on the update it'll even show you there you can see which bait is being used and there you go nice and simple there's so many things you can catch. Um, you can catch crates, you can catch different types of fish. Some of those fish can be used uh, to make potions as well. So you can get special potions that require certain types of fish. Now, another thing is once you get the angler NPC, uh, who you will find at the ocean at either end of the map, he'll give you daily quests in specific biomes for extra rewards. And those include fishing gear as well. You can get an angler NPC outfit that gives you fishing boosts for the outfit, outfit, the outfit, um, and you can also get uh, different other things that he'll give you that eventually can be combined into a tackle box, uh, various other boosts as well, and he'll sometimes give you uh, special bonuses like fishing rods and and so on as well. So that's a whole thing in itself, um, and yeah, there are tons of accessories and and boosts to your fishing power as well. And of course, some of this stuff that you catch can be used as food. So that's another uh, another nice food source. You can take some of this back to either the... Some of this is actually at the workbench. You can make sashimi from certain things like this flounder. So that's another uh, nice type of food that you can do. And other stuff, you can do the cooking pot and take some of that stuff there as well. And make things like... Oh, I've got fruit, so I can make fruit salad, but you can make lobster tail from rock lobster and so on. Lots of uh, food, another great way of getting some of that. Okay, and I've just switched to my other world here to talk about a whole other <laughs> section, a whole other uh, area in the game, which is wiring and mechanisms. So once you've rescued the mechanic NPC, that's the girl here uh, with the wrench, from the dungeon, you can wire up your own mechanisms. She'll sell you various equipment, including wrenches, wire cutters, wires and parts. Uh, this allows you to set up traps, rig blocks, doors and statues to triggers, and much more. So for instance, I can just uh, grab some pressure plate and uh, some wire here. And I've got my, this is a, a much later game <laughs> thing here, but you can see what wiring looks like. You can wire that door to a pressure plate and then by jumping on that switch that'll open and close the door. Um, I'm just going to skip over to somewhere else just to show you, but uh, mechanisms must be triggered by a switch, a pressure plate, or a timer. So let me just show you how far that you can go <laughs> with um, wiring and traps and so on. You can use these, you can collect traps in different areas, like uh, particularly later in the game, the jungle temple, but you can get those dart traps to start with. And that's a whole other topic, um, luck. Uh, actually, you know what, I'll mention that later, but here's what a fully wired thing looks like. Now this is with the, the wired highlighting. If I, you can see where those red lines, those are all the mechanisms. But if I turn that off, um, you can kind of, yeah, I can turn on and off. These are all mostly wiring related things. But uh, this is a timer right here. And if I turn that on, this was a boss arena. Well, an event arena, actually, that we set up with flamethrower traps and spear traps and spiky ball traps and so on. So wiring and mechanism, you can go pretty far with that. 
So let's talk about bosses and events. As you reach certain points in the game, meet certain requirements and improve your equipment, you will have the opportunity to battle various bosses and events. Some, such as the Blood Moon event and the Eye of Cthulhu boss, will happen automatically after you reach certain thresholds of health points and so on. Some events will happen repeatedly at random. Other bosses and events must be summoned or triggered manually. So there's just way too much content to go into all of this in this video, but uh, I decided to show you this graphic that was tweeted from the official Terraria Twitter account. This is actually a very, very small glimpse of what's available in the game. By my count, there are 18 full-fledged bosses plus at least 10 events, including over a dozen event bosses or mini bosses and hundreds of enemies in the game. Not to be begin to even get into the loot, armor, accessories, weapons, and so on. Terraria is a mind-bogglingly huge game which will keep you busy for a very long time. There are also several special world seeds that you can uh, look up and enter when you're creating a world which provide unique circumstances and challenges. There's a whole page on the wiki for those. Uh, on top of all of that, there are also mods, at least on PC, to keep you going more or less indefinitely. <laughs> there are entire mods that uh, change the game entirely, add whole new enemies and bosses and gear and so on. So, let's go back to basics. Uh, this is back in the beginner world that I made for this beginner guide. Actually, it's master mode, but... Um, <laughs> Just wanted to show you some other tips and tricks. So as far as tips and tricks, first of all, make sure that you set your cursor outline. This is in the menu. You can set the border color um, and that is super useful. You can see how much easier it is to see my cursor with that white outline. That's just a, a quick little trick there as well. Um, now crafting and using Spelunker potions is tremendously useful for getting better ores faster, both in pre early pre-hard mode as well as after defeating the wall of flesh in hard mode you can smash altars and and get new uh ores once you're in hard mode so spelunker potions super useful once you have some gold or platinum you can craft these uh check with the guide for the recipe i don't remember it offhand but um you can see what it does the ores are highlighted it's not just ores but uh things like life crystals and um paintings even are highlighted by this gems and all that kind of stuff wow this is a really deep hole um that's why i came down here though just so i could kind of go through here and show you like oh i want some looks like i have oh ha 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 see that's a trap too um and i also want to show you uh how to mine a little faster while i'm here so my food is just about to run out uh so this is a perfect time actually and if you run into a trap like this, it's, uh, you know, you want to disable it by get it, taking those away. So I apparently have platinum. I wasn't sure if I had gold or platinum up until now. But you can see how long it takes me to mine this. Uh, if I use some food and also a mining potion, that's going to speed this up a lot. And of course, if I use a better pickaxe, that's going to speed it up some more. You can get the slice of cake. Uh, from the party girl once you have enough NPCs and she shows up. Uh, you can also get the um, ancient chisel, which you can find underground in the underground desert usually. Uh, you can find that in chests underground more, more broadly. Uh, so you can actually speed up your mining like a whole lot to the point where um, basically you can just bore tunnels right through the, the rock, right through the wall. And uh, other things that you can do early in the game, you can craft the Magiluminescence item, which is super useful for exploring caves and wandering around at night. Uh, once you have 12 Demonite or Crimtain bars and 5 Topaz, you can craft that Magiluminescence um, at an altar, or sorry, an anvil, rather. Uh, that's, again, super useful at night and when exploring in caves because it lights up. It also gives you a bit of a speed boost. Now, buying the Piggy Bank early on which you can see here, you can buy that from this guy, the merchant. That's super useful as well. It allows you some portable storage and expands your inventory space. Um, and you can basically, it's a, a really good place to stash your money. So that's where I have uh, all my money stashed. And you can stash all kinds of other stuff. You can actually take this with you. And it does though, the original piggy bank does need a flat surface uh, piece of furniture or some platforms to place it on though. So what I often do is just early in the game, I'll take the workbench with me and then I can just sit that down and I can take that wherever I go. Again, super useful. 
Um, you can upgrade that later. You can get uh, something called a money trough, which is basically just one that you can um, open in the air. And then eventually you can also get an eye bone uh, pet summoning item that summons the Chester pet, which also is an easier to use option. It's just a pet that follows you and acts as a chest. Eventually you can also get the safe uh, once you've been into the, uh, once you've defeated uh, Skeletron to get into the dungeon. Uh, once you've defeated the boss, you can buy the safe from the merchant as well. Uh, once you've got materials from the dungeon, you can craft the void bag and so on to expand all that further. And you can also keep the piggy bank and or the safe uh, and or the void bag inside of each other to free a couple more slots. With the update, the void bag functions as more of an extension of your inventory uh, and has additional features. So you'll probably want to keep the void bag in your regular inventory and you can keep your piggy bank or money trough and your safe inside of that. Um, and basically, the, yeah, the void bag um, allows you a bunch of stuff. So let's go back to the controls chart because a couple things that are worth learning on here. Uh, first of all, the quick heal, the quick mana, the quick mount and quick buff shortcuts will make your life way easier. Mounts are um, basically animals and other things that you can ride. Uh, there's all kinds of different mounts and you have a dedicated mount slot. So if you equip your mount properly, you can use the quick, quick mount and just hop on and off your ride, so to speak, to uh, travel around and some of them have special abilities and stuff. Quick heal uh, allows you to just use um, healing potions without having to go into your inventory and choose the healing potion and so on. It's just way faster. Same thing with the mana and the buff is to use all your other special uh, bonus um, potions that are in your currently active inventory, including if you have a void bag, if it's open, you can use stuff that's in there too, or you can close it so that you don't accidentally use those things. There's also the auto select feature, which can be very useful to quickly hold or place torches to mine blocks and so on. Uh, let me just demonstrate that real quick. So auto select automatically selects the appropriate tool depending on where the cursor is pointed. So if I point it at uh, say this loom, I can mine that out. If I point that up here, I can place a torch. Um, if I go out here to this tree, it'll automatically, if I hold down auto select, it'll automatically select the axe to cut down the tree. So that's what auto select is about. Um, obviously to literally select the tool that you need for the job. And it's great when you're exploring underground as well because you can just hold auto select to show a torch and light your way and then you can let go of it to go back to say your weapon. Now smart cursor on the other hand is kind of the opposite. It actually selects a target based on the active item or tool. So if I put on my pickaxe and I turn on smart cursor, it's just going to select uh, basically where I might want to mine based on uh, the direction of my cursor still, but it will, um, if you're using a mining tool, it will automatically basically dig a tunnel big enough to um, move through. <laughs> and uh, so that's if you have your pickaxe selected. It uh, will also be, it can also be used with an axe, hammer, or um, to build or place various things more quickly, such as stairs. You can combine smart cursor with mining or building speed boost to get things done very quickly. So food gives you a boost to movement, melee and mining speed. Uh, you can also get mining speed boost from mining potions, mining armor, and so on. Uh, the ancient chisel, the slice of cake from the party girl, once you have enough NPCs, all those things will give you mining speed boost. So let's show you that as well. I'll take some food here, which will help me uh, move my way back over here. So I'll just uh, give you a comparison. Actually, I'll cancel that food. So I'll show you um, smart cursor with just my regular, uh, actually it's a tungsten pickaxe, and then smart cursor or sorry, yeah, smart cursor, with uh, mining uh, potion and food. And you can see that's a good bit faster, and you can go um, quite a bit higher in your speed boosts from there as well. Uh, better pickaxe will also provide you a faster base mining speed in addition to any boosts that you might have. It Basically, it's multiplicative. Uh, you'll multiply the speed of the um, pickaxe with 
the speed of all those boosts up to it's a maximum actually there is a cap on mining speed boost of 70 percent even though technically otherwise you could go higher uh, but there you go um, players using controllers should also take a look at the lock on button which will auto focus your aim on one particular enemy uh, and then there's also auto pause which can be turned on and off in the menu basically what auto pause does is uh, you can see, you know, everything's happening. If I go into here, well, you can't really tell <laughs> unless I uh, go and find an enemy or something. Okay, see that bunny? If I go in here, if auto pause is on, the world around me freezes as soon as I go into the menu. So sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. Um, so that's just a menu option in the settings. Auto pause on, auto pause off. Now, there are certain things where you will need to turn it off, like if you're trying to manually summon a minute mimic, uh, biome mimic, but let's not get into that. That's way later in the game. So uh, most of the time you can have it on and that's going to be fine. It can be very helpful for using items and swapping inventory during boss fights. Uh, you can also open activate to quickly equip armor items and accessories. So I've got like my old armor in here somewhere. Yeah, gear. If I just open activate on that, it's going to swap my armor. Now again, there's also loadouts, so I can even load those ones there and then go back here and just switch back and forth. So all kinds of cool stuff there. Um, let's see. There are also visibility icons for pets and gear. So pets do take up uh, extra buff slots, which isn't a big deal now. The maximum number of buffs has been doubled with the update. Used to be that you could run out of <laughs> the number of uh, buffs and bonuses that could be active at a certain amount of time, and you might need to turn your pets off, but you've got like 44 of them now, so that's probably not a big deal. Um, you can also automatically swap in like a grappling hook, a minecart, a mount, and pets into the dedicated slots for them with that same thing. So you've got a pet, regular pet, light pet, minecart, mount, and grappling hook. Um, if I had any of those, I could just right click on the icon uh, much as I did with the armor and it's going to put those automatically into those slots. So again, very useful and having those in the direct um, dedicated slots is also useful because then you can use your uh, shortcut keys like your grappling hook and your um, mount button and so on. Um, let's see, do I have anything? Yeah, see, I have various uh, accessories. So you can see I've got these things on my hands, so you can turn the visibility on and off, which, yeah, there you go. That one seems to work better. <laughs> so you can see that my, my feet uh, are changing, and you can do the same thing with uh, pets and so on. So there's lots of things that you can do with that. Um, you can rename chests to help organize your loot. So I've already done that with some of these. I've got chests that I've named for ingredients, potions, ores, and bars. All you got to do is open your chest and there's the rename button there. Similarly, you have loot all, which I showed you earlier. Deposit all, which will just take everything um, in there. Quick stack will take anything that matches what's in there um, and stock it in there. And restock is like kind of the other way around where if you've got stuff in your inventory, it's going to pull stuff. Uh, to stack in there. So that's all useful stuff as well. Um, you can also mark inventory items as favorites to avoid having them move to the chest. So normally it'll do that automatically for your hotbar. It doesn't automatically move any of your hotbar stuff, but there is a favorite key on PC. It's uh, left alt, I believe, by default. At least that's what it does on mine, unless I reassign that. So if I want to keep, like, maybe I want to keep this stuff in my inventory, but I don't want to keep this other stuff, then first of all, there's quick stack, but I've already done that. Uh, if I just go over here, if I go deposit all, it's only going to deposit the things that were not favorited. So that's also very useful for inventory management. Um, also information accessories are a thing so you can see I've got the time displayed here there are a whole bunch of these that you can get and if you saw on my other character um, I had basically them all so you can combine those at the tinkerer's workshop once you get the goblin tinkerer you buy that from him and it's used for combining things in general um, you can actually eventually get a GPS and eventually turn that into a cell phone and now with the update a shell phone 
start with crafting a watch from a chain and some bars at a table and chair. That's what this is. Uh, this is not a very good watch. This is a tin watch, so it only shows me the uh, hour if you do a silver or tungsten watch. Um, and again, it's literally a table and chair. So up where Ryan's sitting, you just need a chain and enough bars and you can craft that. So why don't I just show you? I've got some chains. I've got some bars. I'm not going to actually craft a tungsten watch because I don't have a lot of tungsten, but it's 10 bars and one chain at the table and chair. They must be together. Um, if you get a gold or platinum watch, so again, if you have the 10 bars to do that with gold or platinum, that's the one that's actually going to um, give you down to the minute time. A tungsten or silver will give you down to the 10 minutes, and this is a crappy uh, tin watch or copper they'll give you just down to the hour. So I only know roughly what hour it is because I have a not very good watch. <laughs> but a gold or platinum watch is the one that you need to be able to combine that um, into the GPS and eventually the cell phone. And that's a enchanted night crawler, by the way. Some, there are some nights that you'll just find them sitting around. And these guys are the goldfish. You can grab them and you can turn them into soup, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier. But uh, that's some of my, my tips. And that is... Um, hopefully most if not all of, or all if not most of the stuff that you really need to know uh, about the game in general and in the game and uh, to really help get you started. So I hope you like the video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.